with them testing because they haven't been seen out this far before. Mm -hmm. And those were the, yeah, those bone worms. That was so cool. Yeah. I think Brian said the deepest, or the closest they've been seen is off of California, I believe. Yep, that's right. And, and yeah, go ahead. Um, that, that, that's pretty much it. Brian actually <laughs> did most of the uh, processing for that one. So. What kind of creature do you possibly think it was? Some kind of cetacean? Uh, or? We're, we're all invertebrate zoologists out here. We don't know. It's got a backbone. <laughs> we're clueless. Um, we were after the worms. We didn't really care much <laughs> about the skeleton. <laughs> but yeah, if, if if that once we get those to an expert, um, assuming they are Osidax, which I can't imagine what else they would be. Um, that would be about a 3,000 mile range extension in, out to here. Um, and the coloration is different than other documented species. So it's very likely a new species as well. How long will it take for us to get like a positive ID on the worms or to see any kind of published paper about these? Years. Yeah, I mean, I, I hate to say it, but that's the speed of, of that. Even a, even if they move fast and it gets you know processed into the museum and then requested um, to one of the Osidax expert, probably Greg Rouse, um, and um, and he gets it and looks at it and then writes a paper like that's all six to eight months right there, and then peer review can take anywhere from three months to a year back and forth with editors and reviewers. So one to two years is a uh, is not an un unlikely um, delay. Katie, do you still have that uh, question for us? Yes, I still do. Thank you, Ren. Yeah, you're welcome. So the question is, are there any extra challenges to putting the ROVs down this deep compared to other depths? <laughs> yes, there are. We're uh, actually experiencing some of them this dive. Um, the main one is, you know, the deeper you go, the more the water pressure can have effects on your hydraulic system. And there's a lot of hydraulics on Hercules. So we're noticing that um, we are having trouble conjuring up enough hydraulics. Oh, sorry, I misspoke. One second. Okay, scratch what I just said. Dan <laughs> gave me a friendly reminder that that was not true. <laughs> so where's my slurp? <laughs> as soon as you find something to slurp, we'll slurp it. Really? Because last watch couldn't slurp anything. Make it happen. Let's find a coral. <laughs> cool. Excellent. Well, speaking of corals, there's one. I manifested it. You did. <laughs> Good job. either a primnoid or a crisis or a bamboo. I agree. It's okay. either one of those two. Uh, the odds are we are going to want to sample this. I don't know if you're moving or not. Well, I, okay, please stop the ship. All right, go. Let's take twenty. 
Yes, I am aware of the physics of three body. I am aware of the physics of the three body problem. So let's take 20 centimeters of this, please. It was. I actually like the sequels better. Yeah, I think there's some type of promenade. Yeah, the two sequels, yep. Dark Forest and something else. No, you can take more. I, 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 we've got enough people subsampling this that I've been not collecting enough. I got told I need to, the, the data loggers told me I needed more. Yeah, that should be good. We've got all of the small starboard bio boxes open and the aft big one. Um, all of the small ones are open. Number 158. Um, all of the small ones. Perfect. Thank you, sir. How do y'all decide what go or what gets snipped and slurped at versus put in a bio box? Because I've seen coral samples of both. A um, little bit is what we have available, um, and a little bit is what is the texture of it. So. Primnoids are not great for slip and slurps because they have pretty rigid skeletons, and so they have trouble making some of the 90-degree bends um, in the uh, slurp. So they're better for boxes. Chrysogorgids are, are more flexible, and we have seven sample jars on the slurp, and um, so it's just a balancing where to put things, more or less. Mm -hmm. Trying to leave the boxes open for things that can't be slurped. Um, and using the jars effectively. Awesome, thank you. So Brian, we have another biology question. Do fish get the bins? Yep, they can. Um, well, the bins, wait a second. Do fish get the bins? Uh, yes, they can get the bins. Sorry, I, my first answer I was thinking about um, uh, arterial gas emboli, which they definitely get. Um, but yes, they can get the bends as well. Um, so the, the primary barotrauma fish experience, though, is um, their swim bladders expand faster than they can vent gas from them. Um, so for shallow water fish that you might you know, be deep sea fishing for and pulling up from 100 or meters or so, um, the barotrauma that's visible on those is generally their swim bladder uh, increasing in size, which is, you know, if you're a diver, that's more like uh, um, your, you know, your lung over expanding. Um, but they, that the nitrogen concentration and partial pressure of nitrogen in their bloodstream can still increase and get bubbles uh, if you bring them up quickly. And so can whales and dolphins too. They have, it's something that science is still trying to understand is how um, the, the deep diving whales don't seem to get it or they, uh, or if they do get it, they seem to be able to manage it better. 
Looks like we got a little baby anthemastus here. A okay, little mushroom coral. That one has particularly long arms. That might actually be pseudo anthemastus, given how long those arms are. But wasn't talking to you. All good. Yep. So a couple of people have commented online about uh, the possible predator large creature fall from last night with the bones. So the video has already been up online and we've had, or I guess some other scientists have commented on it. And according to the people online saying that it is an odontocete or a toothed whale, but because there was no teeth and there was no rostrum, it's incredibly difficult to ID other than that. So I'm glad to see that there are tons of people out there who are like already, you know, seeing what we're seeing and classifying it out and trying to solve the mystery of, of our creature fall. All right, that's the same thing we just collected. So we're good, thank you. Speaking of snailfish, I was wondering. Uh, I'm not sure yet. Oh, look at those pectoral fins. They're all. Whoa, this is a cool fish. It is so cute. It is look really cute. Look at that big old mouth. It's got like a little kind of a cartoonish mouth on it. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this is a snailfish. Aww. Look at them. Look at it go. How did you get to be so cute? All right, Lynette, you're one of those ugly as cute people. <laughs> <laughs> Look at its mouth. That's cute. It's just kind of swimming around with it halfway open. And it's showing us its tummy, almost like, like a puppy, like you just want to get a little tummy rub. Thank you, Dan. But yep, conjured the snailfish. <laughs> Yay. Why are they called that? That I don't know. I'm excited to have seen a snailfish. That's been on my bucket list. What is that? Looks like sponge remnants. <coughs> mm. Yes, please. This actually looks a little different. I get some yeah. type of Chrysogorgia. Thanks.
to these higher pressures. So are these the same echinoderm species that we were seeing uh, from the past couple of dives, or are these possibly new species? They're possibly new species. My my, you know, ability to tell the species level apart in the echinoderms is minimal, but they're the same. Certainly, they look the same genuses and stuff like that to me. They don't look all that different. And if you look at the depth distribution curves on echinoderms, they're huge. They mm -hmm. have a really, really wide um, tolerance of pressures they can run. When we get down this far, the temperature doesn't drop that much more. Once we're in, you know, below 2,000 meters, we're in the one and a half to two degrees Celsius range all the way down. It does get a little bit colder, um, but, you know, not much. We're at 1.65 degrees today, and we've been, most of our other dives have been between 1.9 and 2.1 degrees. So the temperature's not all that different. Um, the oxygen concentration is a little bit higher down here um, than it has been most of our other dives, but it's it's falling as we're ascending. Uh, we've lost um, almost 7.5% of the oxygen concentration um, value has been reduced in the last hour and a half uh, as we've been ascending. When we're bringing species up uh, from the deep, deep, like here to the surface, so many times when we get the species up, of course, it's it's sadly, usually they don't survive. But what is the reason for that? Is it all of a sudden they're going into an oxygen-rich environment? Is it the temperature difference? Or is it the cold? Or the pressure difference. Oh, sorry, cold. Yeah, pressure. We, I, I cannot tell you definitively, and I'm sure the answer varies depending on the taxa. We generally assume it's the temperature. Um, is Was the... Yeah, I think is the most likely culprit is the temperature. We're taking creatures that have lived their entire life and are metabolically organized for, you know, one to two degrees Celsius and taking them into 28 degree tropical um, surface waters. Um, but the, the change in pressure probably can't help. Um, and, you know, taking them through an oxygen minimum, zo a severe oxygen minimum zone um, we have around here. I mean, truly, like, the oxygen minimum zone here is basically no oxygen. Um, you know, it was one microliter, micromole per liter uh, on one of our dives the other day, as opposed to it currently as 110 uh, micromoles. So it's a huge variation. And so they also mm -hmm. very much may just be suffocating, frankly, on the ride to the surface. Wow. Okay. And some do come up alive. We actually had yeah. a little amphipod the other day we were chasing around trying to um, <laughs> catch in the sample jar. And it was very much still alive. So, Corley, are there any concerns when you're bringing rocks up from the deep sea about temperature, pressure? I have no concerns for rocks. They are <laughs> much more resilient than <laughs> the precious biology. Should we call them rock Ooh. solid? And then we have a question. Are there any deep sea predators down here? Like a big six-gilled shark or a colossal squid? They get rarer. I don't know if we really know exactly what the um, minimum or the maximum depth is for those organisms. But the deeper you go, the smaller the organisms get for the thing. So I've never seen a big shark or something this deep. Um, I don't know off the top of my head what the depth record is, per se. Um, we are getting definitely down on the edge of, um, yeah, the, the microphones. I believe, I believe some sperm whale, beaked whale recordings have had them down in this general area. Um, I want to say the depth, the depth record is right around 3,000 meters. Yeah. The internet tells me that the deepest dive record by a mammal is known at 2,900 meters, so right about where we are. Wow. So if they're coming down here, there's a reason to come down here, though, which means there is some kind of larger food prey items down here. Um, but again, we're driving a very bright, very noisy robot around, and so a lot of the highly mobile predators are going to be hanging out um, and, you know, a ways away from us, and we'll be leaving if they're aware of um, that we're coming. 
So Brian, on this dive, are you looking for anything in particular, like a? Really excited to see what, just a little bit of everything down here. Like I said, this depth range is so undersampled uh, in this part of the world that getting, um, you know, probably collecting almost every coral we see uh, on sponge um, because the odds are that everything we find down here is either a depth range extension, uh, a geographic range extension, or probably new. Um, just because we have so little data, you know, the nearest other work at this depth is the Phoenix Islands, mm -hmm. um, which is nearly a thousand miles to our west. And then I want to ask that same question to Corley. Corley, is there anything in particular that you're looking for down here? Um, uh, fresh basalt samples. Fresh? Yes. What is fresh in a geological time frame? Like, just erupted yesterday, or like, oh, only one million years ago? Yeah, so when we talk about fresh in terms of volcanic samples, uh, we talk about it in terms of fresh versus altered. So, yes, fresh would be uh, something fairly recent, since or not recent, but something that isn't altered, essentially. So it's going to more closely resemble what the chemistry uh, and morphology was when it was erupted. Um, altered, mostly what we find down here is very altered basalt, so the color will change. Um, sometimes the iron in it or other metals in it can get oxidized. Sometimes you can have secondary mineralizations. I know Adam was up here talking about little tiny geodes that form in the vesicles of these rocks. So those are kind of things you want to avoid. You want to get really fresh samples because um, those are going to preserve, have minerals preserved in them that you can then use to date them later on. So after uh, we bring a rock sample back up to the surface and then you take photos of it, you measure it, height, width, volume kind of thing. And then for so many of the samples, we'll slice them into like little slices or cut them in half. What then happens to the rocks after they get sent out to all their various university organizations, whatnot? Uh, a lot of different things happen. So some people look at the ferromanganese crust. Uh, there's a researcher who's looking at the microbes in the ferromanganese crust. That's Beth Orcutt. Um, so they're actually preserved in a different way. They have to be preserved in a minus 80 freezer as opposed Jeez. to just dried out. Well, yeah, because you're trying to, there's, you're preserving the biology. So, okay. Um, and then for ferromanganese crust samples, uh, what I do is I take them back to, they get shipped back to URI, I powder them, I put a bunch of different types of acids on them to dissolve them, and then I run them through a mass spectrometer that gives me the abundances of different elements in the rocks. Mm -hmm. um, I also have in the past made thin sections of the crust and the rock underneath to see the interface between the two. Um, or made like thick slabs of them. Uh, but then for dating the rocks, I've never actually dated a rock myself, but you need essentially it to be cut open uh, and you need to have very specific minerals where you know uh, certain decay rates of different elements. Uh -huh. So like hornblend is one that comes to the top of my mind. Uh, what and is that, what is it? Hornblend. Okay. Uh, is the mineral. And uh, so there are some researchers at the University of Nevada who are interested in kind of constraining the geochronology of this region. So that's what they do. Um, and specifically how the process, how that process works, I'm not familiar with. But I'd be very interested to figure out how to do that. Yeah. So we have a viewer online who has a question. Uh, They've heard recently that rock nodules in the area are being surveyed for mining for batteries and that the radiation was quite high in the nodules from the seafloor. Are you worried about radioactivity in any of the rocks that you have sampled? Uh, I'm actually not worried about the radioactivity of any of the rocks I uh, work with. Yeah, it's one of those funny things about lab safety is these rocks all have a very, very small amount of um, radioactive material in them, as you know, as Corley was talking about, they can use for dating. And so, if you have a rock, there's no safety procedures required to handle a rock. 
But if you take the rock and extract all of the radioactive material and reduce it to a few nanograms of the radioactive isotopes, it then falls in the category of radioactive material and you have mm -hmm. to follow all the radioactive safety protocols for it even though it's got the same amount of radioactivity as the original rock <laughs> but it's only after you isolate the radioactive <laughs> components does it have to be considered radioactive safety <laughs> i know many geologists who work in this part of the world who who do you know rock dating and stuff like that who just find those rules so frustrating to deal with So we have some viewers coming, listening to us saying that we are invited to Kansas City for some barbecue. Mm, that sounds tasty. That, nice. Yeah. I love some barbecue. I got to go to the barbecue um, Hall of Fame inductee ceremony twice now up in Kansas City. God, it was amazing. So Kansas City, you are one of my favorite cities in the United States right now. So uh, my grandma got inducted into the barbecue Hall of Fame. And it was so fun to get to watch this 80-year-old woman walk across the stage and get recognized for her life accomplishments and you know giving back to the community through through food you know because cool. so much of the times are we love what we eat and food is a huge part of our culture a huge part of how we say that we love you to others so i just thought that was so cool we also have somebody coming in from nashville poland finger lakes area hey i'll be up there uh, at the beginning of november van etten specifically Uh, maybe give us like three minutes to Jen check back. Question about snailfish. Could we possibly see a snailfish at this depth? Yes. <laughs> um, I, again, I don't off the top of my head remember the exact depth range, but I certainly think we're in the in the realm for the family. So snailfish are famous for being the deepest fish, right? They can go all the way down. They found them in the bottom of the Mariana. In that family, yep, they they hold the hold the record, just a smidge over, or just a smidge, right around eight thousand meters. I forget the exact number. Are there any shallow water cousins? The same way that echinoderms can be in shallow water, deep water. Shallow or water, absolutely, like up to this depth. But I don't think all the way up to the surface. But again, I'd have to go look that one up to be sure. Awesome, awesome. Thank you. So hello, St. Petersburg. Hello, Kauai. I was just on a Zoom call earlier with um, an SCF who will be coming out here later this season from uh, the Big Island. No, not the Big Island. Where's Daniel from? Now I'm blanking out. Uh, St. Petersburg. And yes, my grandma is Tootsie, Tootsie Tominance. Hello, Australia. So for those online, uh, the other night we saw a some kind of a creature fall, whether it was whale, big fish, something. Chris, I know you were in the lab when this was getting processed up. Uh, were there any, like, what happened to it? Um, well, it got split up to send off to a couple different institutions. Some of it got preserved. Uh, there were some um, Osidec worms that, were, that we preserved to send off and get
Do you have time to do a speed sample on this one too? Those jellies are an enemies. I don't know. Oh. It's a lot of them though. Yeah. Yeah. It I think it's an. I think they're an enemies. Yeah. If you've got the angle, I don't know. It doesn't look like it's gonna be a good angle for the wrist. But this section with all of the um, anemones would be preferred. But. This is definitely Chrysler Gorgia, Chrysler Gorgia of some type with, um, with an enemy's uh, associates. No, that's fine. Nope, that works. So one of the really nice things about Hercules is Hercules has these cutters on it. Um, and so we don't have to take entire organisms. We can just take simple branches. Um, that's good for us back here. If you want to go ahead and stow it, um, which is really a really nice um, ability for us to not have to take whole specimens or do very minimal damage um, for taking a sample. Are those scissor like uh, part of the manipulator? Is that standard practice on ROVs? No. That's, uh, I mean, more and more getting them, but that's uh, a custom add on later. But the, uh, the, the manipulator arms do not come from the manufacturer with that ability. And every ROV team seems to have slight derivations and mm -hmm. optimizations for their vehicle. What's the sample number? Sample 159. 159, Chrysler Gorget at 2783 meters. A viewer online said that snailfish are called snailfish because some of their uh, more shallower but still deep uh, cousins like to hide in snail shells. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> so for those of you watching at home, you'll, you will note that we were going to be much more aggressive uh, in terms of what we sample and much, and much more efficient in what we sample today as a little bit of the factor of the depth. There's so few records that most things down here we expect to be new or significantly ex extensions. So we're going to be sampling more heavily um, while we're deep. And the other aspect that affects this is we've got an extra 1,000 meters of cable out um, than we have been working with, one or 2,000 meters from all the other dives we've been doing. And so there's more layback in Atalanta's position behind the ship. So even if we stop the ship immediately, um, Atalanta continues to swing for a long time, um, an additional than when the ship stops. And so we, even if we stop the ship immediately, we've still got you know, a tether link of motion built into Atalanta, so we have to be much quicker and more efficient um, in order to not lose the momentum in the cable and the tow sled. How far are we away from Kingman Reef or Palmyra on this particular seamount? I think you said last night we, uh, we're we, 50 miles. We were, yeah, we were closer just under 100 the, uh, yesterday, and we moved a lot overnight. So we're now 160, 160 nautical miles, miles almost mm -hmm. due north of Palmyra and 
130 nautical miles from Kingman. Wow. We did a fair bit of traveling last night. Yes. Yeah, we, we took a, a big run north. So while the growth pattern on this one looks different, it's the polyps are pretty similar to the one we just collected. And, and there's a solitary hydroid in there as well. Um, and this one looks like it's being colonized by uh, zoanthids as well. All right, thank you. So when we finish this dive sometime tomorrow, ship time, um, we're going to make another pretty big move and run um, almost due east by about 100 nautical miles to get to the north, the easternmost corner of the U.S. exclusive economic zone down here and do hopefully two dives, remind me of time for one um, over there, and then that'll be it. And then we'll have to turn and head for, head for home. Nice, l nice little extra burst of uh, corals all of a sudden here. I think Leela said her entire watch only saw two corals. Oh wow, it's not a lot. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Twelve Coralie, before shift. Are you taking the SCs? Of this? Yeah. Well, I mean, not right there, but I'm just. Did you get the corals? Oh yeah, I did. Oh, you did. Thanks. Cool. Thanks. I'm glad the 12 to 4 watch got all the boring stuff out of the way so we could start seeing cool snail fish. Don't jinx us. Okay. <laughs> Knock on wood. Knock on your head. It's like, is this, is this, this not, is not wood? No. Oh. I want to look oh. up another. Oh. There's some crinoids something mm -hmm. uh, to the right all right this looks like the primnoid we just sampled a few minutes ago that's good thanks So looking up about snailfish, they can live in shallow surface waters all the way down, of course, to the deepest of the deep. 410 known species. And for our xenophylophore lover out there, they like to lay their eggs in corals, kelps, and xenophylophores. And sometimes the males will protect their eggs. That's dead sponge. Oh. I didn't can tell that either initially, but Oh yeah, a little protelum. Good good eye. Yeah. It's so small. It is so small. Alright, we know what that one is though, thanks.
Yeah, that's a dead sponge stock. So I looked it up, Dan. It was the second one was um, was the Dark Forest, and the third one is Death's End in the Three Body um, Problem Trilogy. Apparently, they're also making a Netflix series. Yeah. I would recommend them then. They're very different, very different, but um, I enjoyed them a lot. A little snail, probably a nematocrasinus. Snail, I meant shrimp, excuse me. Okay. That's like, uh. The other S named invertebrate we see down here. <laughs> well, you got a you got a tube in there, some kind of tube dwelling worm or something. Brian, I know you're allergic to microscopes, but we have a question about microscopes. And do we ever observe bacterial microbiomes in the samples using a microscope on board? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Um, so, do we ever observe bacterial microbiomes of samples using microscopes on board or in a lab? Uh, no, we only we don't get into that, but we do we do are working with a couple of microbiology microbiologists who are interested in the biofilms in the sand and on the rocks. So we are preserving some subsets of certain rocks. Um, zoom sponge, please. Um, and um, and preserving some of the sediments um, for microbial analysis later. Um, but no, we don't get into that on the ship. This is a great sponge. Yes, it's a little different. Um... Can we take a handful? We had at least a good five minute run before between you asking for it and having to stop. Yep, just if you can, te uh, if you can, this could be a good candidate for a snip and slurp, if you want to. Is there a preference on which jar or I? Anything but one or two. And uh, also six might have something in it. So, so five. seven or five. Yeah. Come on, get back there. Mm.
So I believe this is some type of uridid sponge. Looks like we got a little Bryzoan off on the rocks to the left as well. We saw the first little bit. Yep, there's the big part. Perfect. Jar seven. Awesome. And sample number? Sample number 160. Jar seven. Thank you. And thank you, Front Row, for making that quick. And welcome back, Sarah. Have I missed anything fun? Uh, actually, yeah. New primnoid, like new crayosagorgia, and a snailfish. Oh, really? Ooh, wow. We appreciate the setup from your watch. Wow. Whatever. It's <laughs> fine. <laughs> <laughs> we got the purple blog blobby thing, so. Uh, yes, well, they think they caught something in six. It what? Wait. I was like. Oh, yeah. got it. Well, what? what did it look different? Like, do the, the corals look vastly different? Or? Vastly different, no. But different enough that I can't tell them from... They were different. Mm. I mean, it might have just been a Norella, the primnoid, yeah. but it definitely looked like a little different to me. Um, yeah. It may have just been a primnoid with thin polyps that was had its polyps extended. Oh. The Chrysogorgia definitely was not something I was used to seeing. It's probably more oh. like a Pleurogorgia or something. Oh, wow. Okay. Cool. And then we just took the sample that you're did sponge, which yeah. is one I've not seen on the, I know, certainly I not seen on this expedition. I saw that. Mm -hmm. I was very confused. Like the multiple, well, I wouldn't, you wouldn't call them osculums, but. Yeah, uh, I, think, I think that's or right. would word. you? It's either a perculum or osculum, I forget which. Osculum. Osculum. But yeah, all on the side, I saw that. Very neat. We do have a question from um, chat in regards to our National Marine Sanctuary. 
Um, they want to know, um, does it mean no fishing allowed of any type? We don't know yet. Um, okay. So normally, the part of the, the way the process goes is this initial public comment, which just ended a couple days ago, and then NOAA will go through those comments um, and then create a proposed set of, well, at first they'll recommend whether or not it should or should not be designated a sanctuary. And then okay. if they decide to propose that it should be a sanctuary, they will have to propose rules and a governance structure for it. Uh, and then after that proposal is created, it will come back out for, um, for um, public comment again. And, and then, then that's when everyone will have a, again have the ability to get a say in what the level of protections and what the actual detailed rules are. Um, and so sanctuaries, by definition, do not come with any level of protection built in. Uh, each sanctuary, uh, through its own rulemaking process, uh, comes up with its own set of rules, protections, and guidelines. So there is, until we see the proposal, um, we don't really know where and what the suggestions will be. Okay, thank you so much. And then in regards to sponges, um, do sponges lose their at-depth morphology when returned to the surface? Um, no, but during the sampling process, a lot of times they do get a little mangled. Um, right. And so we really don't generally look at the overall, like the gross morphology, like we look at down here with sponges, we look at the, the microscopic morphology and the spicule sh apes. Um, so actually what, we won't do it on the boat, we'll preserve it in ethanol um, and, and both a big sample for kind of, for a voucher specimen and we will, um, preserve a smaller amount for um, genetic work. But for the most part, the sponge experts will probably take that sample and divide it up even smaller, or the, the larger sample, and then digest the, um, the tissue out with bleach, and then look at the spicules under a microscope or potentially even with an electron microscope um, to get a really true ID on it. Sponges are notoriously hard to identify. Ooh, is there a reason why? Just because they can come in so many growth forms. They're all right. white um, for the most part, and you really have to get into the details of their spicules. Um. Uh, yeah. I, uh, I sent a sponge sample from the Phoenix Islands around and to like truly the, the foremost experts in sponges in this part of the world and he gave me, over the course of seven months, three different identifications across two different families as he got further and further through the process. When he first looked at it, he's like, oh, it's X. And then he looked at it a little bit closer a month or two later, and he was like, oh, it's Y. And then wow. he finally got the spicule prep and called a couple friends, and he's like, no, 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 it's, it's W. Wow. Um, after they did all the definitive kind of final testing on it. And the final diagnosis when we're leaving it was actually like, it looks like this other thing from 2,000 miles away. And so um, it may or may not even be, it may be a new species. And the most similar thing we can get it to is this thing from the Philippines. Wow, that's, that's amazing. And so how long does it usually take to get a set to identify um, a species? Copy. I'm um, sorry, Annie, would you say that again? I had too many voices in my head. Oh, no, no worries, sorry. So, um, in regards to identifying or, um, a species, like how long uh, does it usually take to get like a final ID? Okay, no, go ahead. Don't worry. Don't worry. Oop. All right, Annie, sorry. I've no, got all okay. the other voices out of my head. <laughs> What's your question? Oh, oh my gosh. Bruh. Nope. No, I copied you. I'm trying to get. Hello.
know it. Yep, that looks like the same thing we okay. collected earlier. Cool. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, I already made the change. So, Andy, did you have a question for me? Oh, yes, yes. So, um, so how long uh, does it take to get like a final ID on a species? Because I know just based on the explanation, it's it's very intricate. It's very um, specific. Yeah, it could be it, it could be years, frankly, wow. uh, or never. In all honesty, down here, we often um, don't even um, you know we leave them at genus or species or something like that sometimes. Um, so it and so yeah, it's really hard, and there isn't a ton of time. And a lot of that is how much, how backlogged the museums or uh, experts are in getting samples, because they're collecting samples from all over the place, and people are sending them stuff um, from all over the world. Right. In the still cam, looks like there's a red skeleton coming up or something. I think I can barely hear you. Can you hear me now? Maybe no. your volume? Huh? Your volume up? Oh, um, a little. Can you hear me, Ryan? Okay, okay, you're good. You're quiet, but yeah, I can hear you. Okay, that's weird. Um, anyways, yeah, some sort of maybe for Rayad, maybe. Uh, Are you ready for a Zoom? Is that what you said? You're just hard to hear, dude. Okay, it's a little better. But um, some sponge. Remnant? Yep. Yeah, that's better. Thank you. It looks like a vertebr vertebrae. That's why I'm like... Mm, yeah, it kind of does, but definitely a dead sponge. Yeah. All right, thanks. This is kind of an interesting question, but I believe that each species uh, serves a specific uh, role. But this question is, um, if it is difficult to, dis to, to distinguish species of sponges or even species in general, I feel like what's the point of having different species? Um, so the idea, uh, <laughs> this idea actually gets really complicated really right. quick. Um, but basically we think about a species loosely being a um, group of organisms that are capable of reproducing with fertile offspring. So while things may look very, very similar, um, they may not be able to re reproduce. And so you can't have a viable um, population on things that even if they look identical, but for some reason, if they can't reproduce, the population, the community becomes unstable. And so our effort is, as trying to understand the ecology of, a, of um, an environment is looking at species, we try and understand, all right, that's good, thank, thanks, Dan, um, what, the, um, what things are at the species level um, to understand the biodiversity. And if we're gonna manage an ecosystem or understand it, we have to understand what the kind of base reprodu reproductive unit is, and that's always sh should always basically be a species. Um, and so, if they're really hard to tell apart uh, visually, that might be an uh, an example of convergent evolution. But if they if their gametes are incompatible, or even if they're spawning at different times, or they don't recognize um, chemical cues from their mates, uh, it doesn't really matter. They're functionally different. And as we look at more and more understanding relationships of, through genetics and stuff like that, we're realizing that there's a lot more variation that we call cryptic speciation out here where these things are genetically different um, and we can't tell it this visually. That looked like the uh, same primnoid we sampled earlier, just with one branch. Yep. Mm -hmm. cool. Right, thank you so much for answering that question.
And for everybody uh, tuning in from home, um, we are currently exploring the northern flank and summit of Seamount 9. Um, our expected dive duration is about 22 hours uh, with a max depth of 3,100 meters. Uh, if you have any questions, please send them in. Our team would be happy to answer them for you. Also, check out nautiluslive.org for our amazing Yeah, it's recently islands. exposed rock. It's huh. not mang it's Thanks for, un um, with us. rock. Thanks for rock. Wonder what did that? We're about 300 meters to the small um, bump on the larger seamount. Video watch change. Looks like another uh, primnoas we've been seeing. That's the more I see them, the more I convince myself they're norella. But the first Better one we collected certainly didn't look like it. Well, there's also like a bunch of different norella species too. So. Right. Right. Um. Oh, hello. Come on in, Deb. Yay, Deb. Um, another coral in front of us. I think another from Noah. Yay! <laughs> it's all good. Oh, and a cup coral. Um, <laughs> yeah, we have another. Welcome to the ship, Deb. Another prim Noah and a cup coral. Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> I don't really know. So complicated this sample is. Sample wise, do we care about the cup coral or no? Okay, cool. We're good. Thanks for the zoom. So Deb, earlier we were asking who you are, what you're doing here, and where are you going to travel to we next? Can keep going. My name is Deb. You. I'm sitting in the van after eating dinner. Uh, that's what I'm doing here. I <laughs> came in to give Brian a, a dinner break. Uh, no, I am the mapping coordinator on this expedition. I am here to make pretty maps, work with the expedition leaders and the science leaders and anybody else who cares to plan dives and see where we're going and look for all sorts of geology and biology. But I um, work with a great team of you hear them all the time here uh, as navigators, but when they're not navigating an ROV, they're mapping, navigating a multi-beam sonar. And uh, yeah, so we uh, we run the acoustic sonars on board. Have you found any really cool features? I mean, they're mm -hmm. all cool features. That's that's a uh, in front of us. Seamounts, come on, they're cool. They're like <laughs> underwater mountains. That's all cool. We're 
Good, thanks. So when we're diving and we're not mapping, what are you doing? Cleaning up the data? When we're diving and we're not mapping, what am I doing? I'm taking a nap. <laughs> <laughs> no. Because um, you work so hard. You work like 16-hour days so many times. Here. Thank you. I call it your little cave, <laughs> like the data lab. Yeah. We, um, well, all the data that we collect, we have to edit. So I do some editing, do some QC of it. Um, some of the um, mappers, watchstanders do editing, and then I do a sweep back through and do a QC and um, generate surfaces that go into the dive planning mm -hmm. and into the sit reps and things like that. So, um, and then I also have a day job. I'm a data governance manager with the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute. Um, and so I um, work with the PIs um, within the OECI on what their environmental data they collect and um, making it public and archiving it at NCI. Oh, nice. That's a sponge. Yeah, a little bit of budgeting. Ooh, oh, that is sponge. a cold sponge. Mm -hmm. I liked how it looks like a starfish at the top of it. Yeah, it's really that pretty. Kind of um, Based on the structure, I want to say Sacocalyx, but I don't have my guide out in front of me, so... <laughs> but I'm pretty sure it's Sacocalyx. I want to go with, yeah, that sounds 100% correct, <laughs> yeah. Yep. I need my long sunglasses. Adam, are you joining us too? Oh, it is necessary. Doesn't matter to me. Whatever Adam wants to do. I'm good. Sweet. Sorry, Adam. No. He gets to sit in here all day long. All day long, he does. yeah. He does. He doesn't want to do this anymore. I'm glad Another you're here. Another half though. hour? Oh. Of course, I left my readers down in the day lab, so I can't read oh. anything. Oh, on this that's laptop. all right. <laughs> I'll when you get old, you need help I think with the eyeglasses. Not many people are on right now, so it's all good. But was it that sponge? Uh, or that? They all look the same. How do you tell yeah, the right? difference? Yeah, right. Oh, yep. Mm -hmm. This one. Oh, gosh. Me trying to figure out how to use a Mac. <laughs> <laughs> that It's that one, though. Yeah. Ooh, so question for the van from online. Have okay. you ever seen any toxic chemicals or plastics from in the deep sea? Oh, huh. I broke his computer. Um, I mean, personally, I've only seen a beer can, but um, who knows how many microplastics are down here, um, if at all. Which I'm personally, sure I don't are. want to hear my answer. <laughs> <laughs> What's your answer? Because it's like yes to both. Woohoo! I Ooh, did an expedition on a different vessel off the coast of California that was a DPT site, so it was a dump site for hazardous materials. Oh. Mm -hmm. Barrels of something. We had a piece of tarp here the other day. Yeah. Barrels of DDT. Of the car. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any way that they can clean up like those deep barrels down there, or are they just, they're down there? I think it's in some consideration and talks, but I don't have the details on that, so I'm not going to speak to it. Gotcha. <laughs> Roger that. But yes, we do occasionally see trash. Which is sad that it makes it this far into these remote areas, into yeah. these deep communities. Um, no, I'm good. Yeah, thanks. Oh, What's good. Boat? Coralie's back. Boat's doing something wonky. <laughs> but now we're really in trouble because I don't know what anything is, so. <laughs> <laughs> Just look for cool stuff. We'll take pictures of it. I was going to say, they can figure it out from the images. Ooh, sponge. Here's another one. Oh, that's a pretty one. That looks like a beautiful vase. Get some snaps of that. Very different than the one we just saw. Yeah, that's gorgeous. I would put that as a centerpiece in my house.
Yeah, that's a good look, thanks. Corley, what kind of rocks are we flying over? Are they basaltic? How old are they? Well, from what I can tell, it's mostly sediment and ferromanganese crust. But what's underneath, um, who knows? Thanks, Corley. It can be assumed that there are basaltic since we're so uh, oh. deep down. Sometimes we think they're one thing and we open them up and there's something else, so. So Deb, going back to that, um, those barrels, a uh, viewer online is saying a couple of years ago, Nautilus did a dive off the coast where we found some old barrels. Hmm. I do not know about this dive, but... Me neither. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, sometimes you see all sorts of stuff tossed over. Yeah. Which is unfortunate. All kinds of interesting stuff. I mean, for many, many years, we uh -huh. threw our trash into the ocean. Not us, a Nautilus, but us, the human race. Ooh, have we gotten any rock samples so far on this dive? We've uh, had we one. We got one when we first got to the bottom. Yeah. Do you need to periodically sample those, like deep, middle, shallow? I don't think we've made it very far, have we? 2,600 from 31? Oh, no, I'm just asking. Yeah, I don't know. I think they do. That's poorly. Um, I think this uh, expedition, we're kind of just randomly choosing rocks, but um, in past expeditions, I've been collecting rocks for my own research. I would take the deepest depth we were going to, I'd take the summit, and I'd, like, divide them uh, by by however many rocks we were able to take, so that we were taking them at very specific intervals. Uh, but we're not really doing that this Do we want to see this? Stop and look at this coral. Ooh, dab on the telestrator. Do it. Can Come on. You've got, you got the power. You've got the power. You can do it. I don't know. I don't know. Oh. Oh, it worked. Oh, that's weird. I've never done that. Sorry, everybody. Telestrator. Newbie. Sorry, been it's exciting. It, so. I want to I wanna cheer you on and applaud you. OK, it's just a telestrator. Let's not go crazy. I want to. <laughs> good for you, Deb. <laughs> Can I do a telestrator? You go, girl. You go, girl. What do you do? Pick this? Draw a circle. Cool. Ooh. Oh, that's next level. Coralie said I could do emojis. Nope. <gasps> I'm a simple point and click. Can we do that? Can you put little emojis up there? Like when we see the snailfish, be like, heart, heart, heart. For the screen. I know. <laughs> I was like, I will give you half my cookie if you want. I know I saw that there was a uh, one last cookie, and I definitely had to go and steal it. Ooh. Oh, it's that little like crimnoid. Crimnoid. Crimnoid, maybe. Trying to see what there are other things stuck to the side of that rock that were weird. Like there. I think that's a dead something. Uh, yeah, it looks like a dead sponge stock. Yeah, that sponge stock with some oh, like anemones yeah. growing on it or something. It's a super. There's zone. like a big. Um, there's a big something in um. the in the still cam. 
Yeah, we're uh, I don't know if you guys can see it, but it's just up off to it's our over right. Yeah. Like a sponge. Yeah, giant sponge. Giant sponge wow. coming soon. Very big. I love it. It's already in the still camera, but we can't see it on the main screen. Yeah, there the still camera is looking a bit forward. There it is. That is so tall. Yes. Stop here for a second if we can and take a look at it. That reminds me of like, you know those cornucopia things around Thanksgiving? That's what this looks like to me, like a white one. It's really pretty. Uh, I, should we sample this? Yes? No. no. Just kidding. Not sampling this. Just taking a lot of images of it. That's okay. <laughs> it's a, cool a really good look giant at it. Sponge. I love it. Every ship at sea has a cookie monster. I'm definitely not the cookie monster for this expedition. They're oatmeal raisin, which are lovely, but I I kind of prefer Thank chocolate chip that. over them. We got great images on mm -hmm. the still cam, like 40,000 pictures of a giant sponge. Very excited. Ooh, how old do you think the sponge is? Good question. Corley, we have Can a, quick zoom, please? a couple of questions for you. What is your current scientific study? And what are you able to compare from the rock samples from the different depths? All right, thanks. So yeah, that's, the, that's the crisis. I Thank study you. the mechanisms of enrichment in ferromanganese crust. Um, so that means I'm looking at what, what are some relationships that we see between metal enrichment and the ROV Hercules is outfitted with sensors. So we collect uh, information on oxygen, salinity, temperature, depth at each point of sample location or collection. Uh, so I compare those two things. Uh, we see pretty strong correlation between seawater oxygen and cobalt concentration in the rocks. This is a known um, relationship between the two, uh, but I have pretty tight constraints on mine, mm -hmm. but also using the very specific depths that we have, I can look, I see some relationships with rare earth elements. Um, we can see relationships with titanium, nickel, different sorts of things. But having the, having the sensors on Herc is uh, really important and really uh, crucial to my study. Because a lot of times people when they do these kind of large studies, they'll use models to estimate oxygen mm -hmm. concentration in the seawater, but I um, actually have it measured. So it just uh, gives us a more refined view. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, another giant sponge coming up. Oh, that looks like one of those ET sponges. Or maybe not. This is some type of colophagus. Looks like a petalus. Uh, I'm trying to, sunflower.
All right, science is happy, thanks. So going back to what we were talking about earlier with the, uh, the barrels of DDT, I'm looking up about uh, when they went and explored that with Sebastian. Okay. So we're getting close. <coughs> Our dive plan today has us coming up, uh, up to a local high, like a little, uh, a little point, uh, halfway up this. Uh, I mean, not even halfway up, but about a third of the way up the overall height of the feature, and we're getting close to that now. Uh, and then we'll do a little downhill section, and then we'll be in a saddle between the larger summit and this local high, and then we'll continue on after that, uh, all the way up to the summit of uh, this seamount. Like I was saying earlier, this is a different feature uh, shape than we have been um, diving on previously. Um, we've been almost exclusively on geos up until, can we look at this please? Um, we've almost exclusively on geos and this is a more of a ridge shaped seamount. And some of my research has been trying to understand whether these large scale, what we call gross geomorphology of the feature actually influences the uh, communities on it. So this looks like a dead sponge, but I think it might be and it with a, actually it's got a little live section left on it. Um, and the, But this is one of the largest sponges I think I've ever, or tallest at least, I think I've ever seen. Can we sample that? Are you sampling the live part or the dead the part? The live part. Okay. Is there any use in sampling a dead sponge or no? Um, I actually don't know. I'm not sure how, the spicules are pretty hard, so I suspect some of the spicules might still survive, but we wouldn't be able to get any genetics from the dead part. This actually what's growing here looks different than what the stalk is. It may be a secondary colonization of this thing. About half of that, please, sir. Um, so I'm not sure that the sponge we're sampling is actually the sponge that, um, yeah, right there works, um, is we see the dead on it. We see the dead on it, the dead skeleton below it. It's getting late in the cruise. My ar my articulate abilities are failing me. <laughs> A little more, please. Looks good, thanks. Uh, I'm afraid it'll get jammed in the 90 turn on the, s on the thing, so let's say box. So the third one, the third small box. Sorry, Bart. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, no good. I was gonna ask, how does a sponge die? And um, is it something that kills it, or does it just 
die of old age or? Uh, I think all of the above are possible. Oh, okay. um, they, there is some evidence of density dependent diseases um, that can attack them. They do have a level of immune systems, you know, food supply, There's a, it could just get knocked over. I think that's a real common way these things die is they get knocked over for some reason uh, and they get pushed out of the flow and can't eat and feed anymore effectively. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the short answer is we really don't know. Um, the long answer is we know there's predation. We know getting knocked over is a problem. Um, and, um, you know, most all organisms have some form of lifespan. This looks like the same sponge we sampled uh, a few minutes ago. Not the same individual, but the same. Um, same genus, at least. And then there's a giant coral to the right. Mm. And the DSC can. Now I have data. Take a close look at that, please. Nav data. Yep. Did you get that sample number? Roger, roger. Deb, we have a question for you about mapping. Shoot. Okay, so after you map out an area, how do you plan the routes to best accommodate for so many different objectives? Geology, biology, depth yeah. constraints? I mean, sometimes we don't get them all at once, and, and Brian can probably maybe speak to this a bit better, but um, I just draw dots on the map <laughs> for them. Um, but there's, you know, there's different um, features that they're both looking for. So I know a lot of times looking for coral, we're looking for steeper slopes. Um, we want to look for areas that might have better current flow, things like that. Uh, so that might drive which side of a seamount we pick. Um, but typically, Bamboo. once Bamboo. that sort of been decided, like which corner looks good to all the parties involved, then it's sort of finding sort of rockier features or steeper slopes and things like that. So we don't always get everything in every single dive. We try to... Um, you know, if there's something that looks like it'll be good for both, then we'll definitely try to go for that. But if it looks better for coral and we're at depths that they want to collect coral at or mm -hmm. um, you know it's sort of alternates per dive kind of thing um, so we d over the entire expedition we we try to accomplish as many of those goals with a variety of different um, types of dives and we've been able to accomplish that on this one quite well we've done some east side dives which are harder because of the weather and the ship position um, at times, and um, west side dives um, have been more prevalent, and that All tends right, to be the side that a lot of people do um, because of the orientations of ships and weather out here and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So, awesome! Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Ooh. Um, question for Brian. Will climate change bring about higher numbers or lower numbers at this step? Or are we unsure? Numbers of coral, number of what? Number of coral, sponges, et cetera. Um, <laughs> likely, I would assume lower. Um, if we think about uh, oxygen minima zone expanding uh, and getting potentially deeper, um, and if you start warming these, like I said earlier, when we were talking about um, samples as they come up to the surface, the temperature really affects them. And um, so if we start warming up the environments down here, I don't think that would be good for the uh, life and it is so hard to live down here that um, there aren't a lot of other creatures I would expect to uh, colonize areas that would be abandoned by these species. So I think a raise in temperature would be really pretty bad. But one of the other things that's going to really affect this is any changes in primary productivity in the surface waters. That's the food source. So if you warm up the waters enough that you shift um, a plankton bloom further north or kill off a plankton bloom or something, that's going to have devastating effects uh, on the communities below that are used to having an annual pl plankton bloom. There's also a lot of other ways that climate change can affect different things. There's a lot of processes and cycles. So there's like anticipated that AMOC or the Atlantic Meridional Returning Current um, might slow and that is responsible for bringing oxygen to the deep ocean. So if something happens to uh, that, you know, I'm assuming. Yeah, the, absolutely. That would, have, that would have absolutely mind-blowing, devastating problems. And that flow, you know, basically the North Atlantic is the source of the vast majority of the um, downwelling water into the deep, uh, deep, deep ocean for the entire globe. Um, there are a few other sites that it happens, but the majority of it comes from the North Atlantic that fuels the water here. Now, it may take a thousand years for that water molecule to get from the North Atlantic all the way down to the South Atlantic around the uh, Southern Ocean and back up to the Equatorial Pacific. Yeah. Um, but if you think about it, some of these corals and some of these species have been alive. You said, I think, one was the highest age we have is 4,000 years, so yep. that could wipe out, you know, exactly. one in its lifetime. Yep, unquestionably. And and the ramifications of whatever we're doing now are baked in for potentially even thousands of years down here. Um, you know, even if you start doing rapid carbon sequestration, active carbon sequestration, and doing it, any changes that occur between now and balancing that um, carbon out now could affect this environment for hundreds, if not thousands of years, um, even if we correct it in another 50 or 100 years. So Deb, I know they just pulled up the map on SAT-3. Will you tell us a little bit about what our viewers at home are seeing? Yeah, as long as I turn on SPL and everybody's okay with that. Is there any, yes, ma'am. Any major science interruption? Go for it, go for it. Uh, okay, so what you guys are seeing right now is Google Earth, and you have uh, the Hawaiian Island chain up at the top of the screen, and the Line Islands here at the bottom, and we are currently working on um, this area here off the, of the Line Islands, and uh, we are currently diving at this number nine that you see on the screen. So there was 16 sites that we had potentially wanted to um, do some exploring on for this expedition. And um, the colors that you see, the light blue and light green colors are existing bathymetry in this area. And the purple to yellow colors that you're seeing is new bathymetry that Nautilus has collected on this expedition. And so um, as is you um, can see, we've mapped, we've kind of gone around a couple of different seamounts. We started up at the top here, we went down and um, did a number of dives on various um, ones already. And we are currently here at site nine. So as Brian was saying, this is a little bit different than a normal guillot seamount that we've been diving on um, a few times here. And um, what did you call this, Brian? Was it like a ridgeback type feature? Yeah, I, I've been calling this a, a ridge seamount is the nomenclature I'm inventing, frankly. 
Yeah, I always tend to call them dragon tails because they look <laughs> a little bit like the back of a dragon, I would think. Um, and uh, yeah, so then if we switch over into uh, our 3D view of it, you can see this is the, um, so I'll give you a start in what we call north up view. And you can see this feature <coughs> has a very different style, um, not different than other features around. There are a number of these ridge mounts. Um, uh, thank you. Sorry, what do you want to see, Brian? Roger. Go ahead, Daryl. And um, so we are diving on the north side of this feature. Mm -hmm. We've already made it up the top of this first um, first sort of bump feature here, and we're up. Oh. Now going to traverse across the top of the seamount. Has have you found anything so far that has been very surprising? Like any features or? Not really, no. I mean, th most of these features are pretty common around here. I mean, we've seen some interesting, um, on some of sure. the goats, you can see the what is probably or was the um, the sort of reef that gets built. So when they extend above the sea, uh, sea level, uh -huh. um, they build up reefs. Um, and then as they sink back down, you can sometimes see that kind of different stepping yep. along the, the plateau, um, which is kind of interesting. I Come always find these rock minutes. features on these <laughs> ridgebacks look like scales, or like I said, like dragonbacks, but they also look like somebody took a finger and, and took out like some Little frosting out of a cake or something. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, they're kind of really neat. That's a snip and slurp or snip and jerk. And um, well, there you are. As you can see, there's a bit of a T at the top. This is going to be a. Um, are you tight there, Daryl? Whoever the chief scientist here at the on the. Watch lead right, gets Joel. the choice when we get to the top to go mm -hmm. uh, north or east south. or west. Oh, east or west. Yeah. So a little bit of 5A, 5B options here. Mm -hmm. Kind of like pick your own adventure. <laughs> oh, yeah. Books. I think Jules on her Instagram takeover put like where should we go? People have been voting online where to, where to uh, go. Oh, that's cool. That's a really smart one. Oh, th have they been in on this one? Yeah. The top? Oh, really? I didn't know that. That's cool. Yeah, so there, there's your view. You can choose to a head down bit, east towards the bump or west towards the downhill. I think what is your personal preference? Key. Oh, I don't know. I think bumps are always cooler. <laughs> Corley, what's your preference? East, I west, bump? I think I voted for B, whichever one that was. I can't even remember. I voted for the one that didn't have that. And I don't remember which nice. one I labeled earlier today. Close so on all the these polyps when he touched it. On the way back, will we be mapping as well? Yeah. Uh, we already have a transect. Oh, 15 all. there. Is it? Um, so after this dive, yeah. we're going to head over to this area. Uh, not quite um, on the knife there. Sites 11 and 10. Uh -huh. So there'll be um, a couple of dives here. And then we'll um, I thought I had it in this file, but it doesn't look like I do. And then as we get back, um, head oh. back for Honolulu, you kind of look at the existing coverage of things and pick out Seamounts that don't have data over them, and we kind of uh -huh. hit a few of the tops on the way. Kind of call it seamount hunting. So we see a lot of Roger. data at the they top of this. They hit, you're too close. Is there any mapping data towards the bottom, like when you just zoomed out? Right. Yeah, so in that lower part of the little down here. yellow. Yeah, there is mapping data. I only... You just did that one section, because that's yeah, where we're... So these are Focusing. The reason why it looks a little erratic in what you're seeing is that I only I exported data out of multiple different resources, and so it's very time-consuming to have to draw boxes and export it out and um, and bring it into various different projections to then mm -hmm. get it into this software. The so part. you tend to only focus on the area that you're working. We don't tend to do it for the whole planet at once. Is that something that so Nautilus is part of that worldwide? Uh, initiative to map the entire seafloor by 2030. 
Uh, does our uh, data get go? compiled into that, into the JEBCO database? Yes, it does uh, make it to JEBCO, um, and um, it makes it into a number of different repositories, but the data from Nautilus goes to R2R, which right. is Rolling Deck to Repository. I see it. So you can see all of the data that Nautilus collects there, with the exception of the, uh, video. <coughs> you got enough bandwidth to data? turn the slurp uh -huh. on there when uh, they're the ready? The video, um, the imagery... Zoom in there a bit the for us, Daryl. Vehicle information data goes to MGDS, which is okay. Marine Geoscience Data Systems. Um, it's operated up at Royal Authority. Um, and they both push um, what data they can to NOAA's NCEI repository. Really? Mm -hmm. um, and oh, 100%. Jebco pulls from, from both of those. Um, so when you get back on land, is there going to be more things that you have to do with this mapping data that we've collected out here? No, we process all of it on board. Um, so close. Deep water data is pretty fairly reasonable to get through. Um, so we um, clean all the data while we're here. Uh, we create turn it off for a final second. surfaces. Mm -hmm. um, and those final surfaces, as well as all the raw and clean bathymetry, go with the data archives. I'm sure there'll be um, some potentially okay, additional generation of stuff if somebody needs to make something for a particular project <laughs> or presentation or things like that. About 100 percent there. No, the expeditions are encapsulated kind of like that because then you're on to the next one. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we're even uh, coming yeah. back in a Don't little bit early so we can make room for the next expedition transiting I've up to smashed it into the rock. British Columbia, and then our. Expedition with Ocean Networks Canada. Yeah. Come on, come out of there. It's going to be a fossil in a thousand years now. All right. Really? This is called a bash and slurp. <laughs> it's definitely a bash and slurp. Did it make it to the jar yet? <laughs> From up. <all> the <laughs> there it is. Okay, you can turn that thing off. Roger. Well, I'm impressed you didn't uh, pick me up off the rocks yet. <coughs> you did very well, thank you. Don't you do it. Why do you not stick? Ah. Oh. Stay. <coughs> it's about as close as you can get there, buddy. <laughs> I think you were single digits there, right? How'd it feel? Gotta like it. Never gets old. Roger, I'm gonna come under you here. I'll just look for the light, the light that's ran on the rocks. Okay, Lena, I think you can. Yeah, I think we're ready.
right into you. Oh, that's a great shot of Hercules from Atalanta. I'm going to go over here to the rocks. Thanks, Deb. <laughs> yeah. Tim in Nevada. Did you manage to rotate the jar too to roll it? I'm going to ask you to hold on to that question look. for just a moment. Have a look at the jar, see if it's, see, I didn't get to see if it, how well it's lined up. Perfect, thank you. Ready for the next sample. When we see a brown kind of sponge like that, is it dead? Is it just unhealthy? Or is that just its appearance? I generally operate on the assumption it's dead. It's not necessarily some do coat themselves in some sediment or something sometimes, so it's not a guarantee they're dead. But um, that's kind of, if you look closely, you can kind of see if the, the, the pattern, lattice pattern is still kind of intact or not. Mm -hmm. um, if you get close, you can actually see the tissue and tell if it's, you know, if it's sloughing off or not. Um, but yeah, I mean, as a close approximation, I generally assume that when you see you, brown sorry. like that, I assume it's dead. I don't know if you saw that, st there's like some stuff to the right, like a giant coral and maybe a sponge. So is any of this once upon a time a submerged reef? I don't think so yet, looking at this terrain. Right, this is all pillow basalts, correct, Corley? This is all pillows, yes. Yeah. Is this typical about what you think you would see from a feature like this in this area? Or is this like a odd or interesting? Is this, sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, so is this type of geology down here, is this typical of what you expect you would find? Yes. Take a quick look at this sponge, please. All right, thank you. Brian, is this more or less um, interesting than you thought you were going to be seeing? Uh, this is pretty. This is pretty par for course for this depth, I would say. Um, it's got a piece of fair amount of diversity. We're not seeing a lot of the same organisms over and over again. We're seeing, you know, a few of each kind of um, different types, 
in relatively close proximity to each other and then another one. Um, but, but no, seeing this level of density and, you know, a few different um, members of the same families we usually see, but that look a little bit different, maybe different genus or species, uh, is pretty much what I expected at this depth, yeah. I wouldn't say I expected I these particular families or individuals, but that's a pretty common um, low abundance, you know, moderate diversity um, down here. Is it? Oh no, shadows, never mind. Are these dead? For rayed spon sponges that we're seeing. Yeah, that's my. That, that have we I think seen you're right. any live ones? Uh, Just I dead ones. Have not seen the ones we've those three or four that type. I don't remember seeing a live one yet. No. Okay. Do you think any of these rocks might be kind of? Yeah. Can we try it? Do you think we can yeah, try this? Yeah, I think we should. Dan, can you get out in the sand and see if either of those, any of those three rocks are free? Very right, yeah. What's that? I think you're... Uh, I'm sorry, I gotta turn you back up. Your dinner relief is... Close my eardrum out. Pick up one of those rocks, right? That. Okay, I think these ones might be. Yeah. Um, just from the still cam view, they look like they might be a little bit easier. Roger. They're just covered in silt. And yeah. <laughs> but we don't care out. about that. We care about what's on the inside. <laughs> what's on what's the inside that counts. That's what, yeah. Uh, that might be pretty solid, actually. Hold on. Bonk. Oh, man. Appears to be solid. What about the what about three about next the, to it? Yeah. Uh, I'll check it out. Can we just poke Whoa. everything? <laughs> sure. I enjoy poking the rocks. There we go. Yeah, oh. that looks pretty solid, too. What about the little one right there? Uh, uh, yeah, solid. Pretty sure the one I'm sitting on is solid. Uh, okay, I'll tried. package it back up. Any yes. time I get to use the arm, I'm happy. <laughs> yes, Amber, I realize I may have cursed us by waiting to the top, but you know it comes from in place if we get it from up here. Mm. Here, poke a few oh, more. Let me land sure. first for you. Oh. Solid too, but yeah, I think that might be difficult. Never know. Not solid. Okay, pick the arm up and move over a bit. Bonk a few more here. Ooh, nearly covered the digital still camera in mud. <laughs> that would be tragic. Let me uh, touch first for you, bonk. So. Copy that. Uh, I would say those are solid. Okay, you want to move it back and we'll make some tracks here. That was a little Tina for that just flew through um, the view. Okay, I'm off blue. Roger. Uh, 
Uh, grab it again. We'll bonk a few more here. Maybe some of the ones in between the big one there might be this. Yeah. Near your uh, sizing lasers? Yeah. Okay. Maybe. We really just need a jackhammer on the vehicle. Seriously. Uh, I don't think so. Looking pretty solid. Bonk around some of the other ones. Can I see it move? No. Oh. Uh, swing your arm to the right a little, you're getting Copy. Yeah. Arm right, y'all left. There you go. Gotta tuck it in a little, look in your down cam. Doing the funky Egyptian. Pretty solid. Did I miss any likely candidates? Not, th not from no. my point of view. Yeah. Not from mine. Okay. All right. Copy that. I think we're good. good try, we'll continue tracking up. Thanks for trying. <laughs> Thank you for giving me a chance to do with it.